Hey everybody, welcome to Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matthew Weber. Now, usually I do this podcast every week, or at least I've been trying to do this podcast every week, but I skipped last week, and one of the re- reasons I did that was because I wanted to have a little bit extra time to go through and develop this topic that I'm going to talk about this week, and that's specifically Windows Subsystem for Linux. Now, at the end of the last episode, I had no clue what this was. I mean, I had a vague idea. I knew you could run Linux on Windows. I didn't even know what it was specifically called. I called the Windows Subsocket for Linux or something. <laughs> I was just, like, I had no clue what it was to for. I knew it was WSL. I knew what the acronym was, but I had no clue what it stood for. But it is Windows Subsystem for Linux. And um, it's on its second version now, and I thought it was a good opportunity for me to figure out what this was all about now i will there's a couple uh things i want to get into but first let's do a little bit of contact info you can if you want to contact me at, or the podcast at any ways you can do that uh at the linux cast on twitter uh i'm at mtwb on twitter you can email us at the linux cast at gmail.com or like us on facebook at facebook.com slash linux cast you can also subscribe to all our podcast on any uh you know pod catcher pod feed or whatever that you want you can find a list of where we're at at the linuxcast.org and you can also subscribe to us on youtube now that that's out of the way let's jump into uh wsl or the windows subsystem for linux we're not going to call it the socket for linux or http TPS or whatever. I don't know where I, why I got, got so confused. I, I I knew it in the back of my head what it was called. Anyways, WSL. What is WSL? Now, this comes directly from the Microsoft Docs. So I'm going to just read this verbatim. There's no sense in me trying to define it in my own words. The Windows subsystem for Linux lets developers run a GNU slash Linux environment, including most command line tools, utilities, and applications, directly on Windows, unmodified, without the overhead of traditional virtual machine or dual boot setup. Now, that's very interesting. Uh, in other words, it allows Linux developers, and we need to keep that in mind, Linux developers. It's not, this is not for the average Linux noob who wants to use Linux but doesn't want to leave behind their precious Windows. It allows Linux developers or Windows developers who wish to try their hand at Linux-based development to use Linux applications without having to go to the trouble of dual booting, which <laughs> dual booting, I dual boot, and uh. If anybody knows me, uh, you know I just I can't stand Windows at all. But I have Windows on a partition, and I use it for some gaming that I can't get to run on Linux. Um, but I go there very rarely. But anyways, I mean I can you can see how some people just you know wouldn't want to dual boot, so maybe WSL gives them that opportunity to use Linux tools. Um, it also prevents them from having to use a virtual machine like Parallels or whatever. Uh, that would definitely take away from the Linux experience. Um, so, with uh, WSL version 2, Microsoft has added loads of uh, function, new functionality, including the ability to run GUI Linux applications. Now, there is um, a proviso here that that's not true yet. Uh, apparently, that's coming later this year, but there are a workaround for that, and I will talk about that here in a minute. Um, it also, for the first time, a lot, uh, has brought full, the full Linux kernel to Windows, which is, I mean, just think about that for a minute. Microsoft, back in the early 2000s, and even before that, despised Linux. They tried to sue it out of existence. They would go through and find every little patent that they had and try to make sure that the Linux Foundation and everyone and you know who owned or tried to create Linux had to pay out of the, their teeth for using whatever but that's over with now Microsoft loves Linux <laughs> and my, you know, they have t-shirts Microsoft hearts Linux it's it's a little creepy but it, apparently it's true 
uh, the Linux kernel allows uh, almost complete interaction with Linux, almost as if you're using Linux natively. Oh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, e even more surprising is that Microsoft has worked hard to bring Linux, the Linux file manage bring Linux file management to Windows Explorer. Which, so first of all, Windows Explorer is horrible. It's, we can disagree on that. It's bad. Um, but with WSL2, you can now go through and interact with your Linux file system right through the Windows GUI without having to go into the terminal or whatever. It allows users to interact with their Linux file system directly from Windows, which is what I have written here. I don't know why I repeated that. Um, for developers, this essentially gives them full access to the Linux ecosystem without having to do a boot or switch to Linux completely, which uh, could be a good or bad thing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So. You'll notice throughout this whole thing, I've said developers like 10 times so far. Uh, you know, Steve Ballmer did that whole developers, developers, developers thing. And really, that's what who WSL is for. So the answer to the question of who is de WSL for is developers. If you're a developer who, ha who has to use Windows, it's the key thing. If you absolutely have to use Windows all the time and it doesn't make sense to have to switch back and forth between Linux and Windows, then WSL is likely for you. And mostly this is for the creation of Linux tools to, to excuse me, it, it, it's mostly for those that need Linux tools to develop applications, mostly for, the ser for servers and uh, cloud tools and things like that. Um, WSL makes it much easier than having to switch back and forth between Windows and Linux like you'd have to if you do a boot. Um, as I'll talk about in the next section, WSL isn't easy to install. So the reason why I have this here is because uh, WS, because it's not necessarily the easiest thing to install, it's not for people who, you know, let's say you read about this and you, you're just a Windows user, you're not a developer, and you want to use Linux, but that you think that this is a good way to try Linux, that's not the case. At least right now, it's not the case that if you were just looking to try Linux, this is not the way to do it. It's much easier to download Ubuntu, put it on a, a USB key, and boot into a live environment. It's way easier. I mean, there's just so many different steps to WSL that you have to do, and they're all complicated in some form or fashion, especially for somebody who's never done it before or doesn't work in a terminal all that much. So, really, WSL is just for developers and nobody else. I personally think that Linux is easier to install, like I said. So, WSL isn't an option for people who just want to go through and experience Linux. Linux evangelists really shouldn't. All right, so, there's, there's been this... We're going to talk about this a little bit later, but there's a, an idea that WSL is going to somehow take away uh, people's interest in installing Linux, and that's just it's not the case. And I'll, like I said, I'll talk about that later, but because it's so much more difficult to install, I don't think that that's a big deal. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about my experience with WSL2. So uh, after the last episode... I tried to install it for the first time, and I couldn't do it. It kept giving me an error. Uh, I could get WSL 1 installed and Ubuntu installed, and it, you know, it was fine, but you couldn't really use it. And in order to upgrade to WSL 2, you have to have virtualization technology enabled on your BIOS. And it doesn't make this clear outside of one single sentence in the instructions. So if you've, you're not reading carefully or you just you know missed that part, you're screwed because it doesn't exactly explain what it is um, or why you need it or anything. It's just one sentence in maybe you know a 700 word document about how to install WSL2 and if you miss it WSL2 can't be installed. So it took me a while but eventually I was able to actually install Ubuntu 2004 on WSL2. I even managed to get a workaround up and running to, that allowed me to install XFCE which you know, I mean, I just, that's awesome, right? I mean, <laughs> you're using XFCE on Windows. I mean, it's like, it's a miracle. Um, my first observation is that this is not for noobs. So I've talked about this before. It's, installing Linux itself is actually quite easier, at least, if, you know, Ubuntu. You know, I mean, you can talk about Arch or whatever, but I mean, 
if you're just installing Ubuntu, it's way easier. In order to get WSL working, you have to go into your BIOS and set up virtualization. If you don't do that, it will not upgrade from WSL1 to WSL2. Uh, now, if, it, if you're a developer, this isn't a big deal. It's just a single setting in BIOS, and, and you, you go in, you change that setting, reboot, and it, you know, then WSL2 will install properly, and everything will be fine. Um, but it is for, the problem is that setting is different on every motherboard uh, or computer manufacturer or CPU that you have. It's it's named something different. It's in a different place. You interact with it differently, uh, and it, it's going to de really depend how you do how you do that is really going to depend on what kind of hardware you have. And <laughs> because of that, because there's so many different ways of this hap doing, you know. So many different ways of doing it. You have to Google, you know, how do I do this on so and so motherboard? So for my it was a, an or an Aorus, an Aorus. It's a, it's a gigabyte board that I just you know just used for my new computer um, that I can't even say the name of. Uh, and uh, you know, I, because I knew the hardware and you know I was able to find out how to do it. But if you just have you know, you have a pre-build or whatever. You'd have to know what the the you know, like the model of your computer was and how to do that in the BIOS and whatever. I mean, it it adds that extra layer of complexity, so it can be hard to find instructions on how to do it, uh, do this virtualization thing, if you don't know what your computer actually is. So this is definitely not for noobs. All right. So now that being said. It's like I said, I talked about in the last section. WSL isn't meant for new users of Linux. It's, it's just not. It's meant for developers um, and try, people who try to force WSL into the uh, mold of having it be for new Linux users is just doing all those users a complete disservice. Um, once you set it up. If you're just going to be working in the terminal, you're great. I mean, the terminal apps work wonderfully, and you can view all, you can vim all the way home if you want. Uh, I mean, like you can um, in in install all sorts of different terminal commands and terminal programs, and it's really good. It's it, it, the problem comes in is once you want to do anything graphical, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, so. Right now, there's a workaround to install uh, graphical uh, programs and desktop environments. Um, right now, if you want to use a GUI, you have to connect it via an XRDP uh, or connect it via XRDP and then connect to it via remote server session. And the fact that you can do it at all is just, I mean, it's mind blowing that we're at this point. I mean, it's just really, really cool. I mean, as a nerd, you're using Linux on Windows with a full Linux kernel, and you can do everything on Linux that you want. Uh, there's a GUI there, and you can just use it as a Linux computer if you want, right alongside your your Windows games or whatever. The problem is it's so slow. I mean, it's just so slow. Um, and I mean slow, slow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can emphasize how slow it is. I mean, it's it's not so slow that it's unusable. I suppose I shouldn't get so bogged down to being slow that it's unusable, but it it, it doesn't seem to matter what your computer hardware is. Uh, you know, I'm running a, a Ryzen 3800X and I have 64 gigabytes of RAM, but it, and it was slow. I mean, um. I'm not sure if you can go through and have it, you know, allocate more resources or whatever, like you can in a traditional VM. I'm not sure. I didn't get that deep into it. Um, maybe there is, but it was just very slow. Um, and it, and when I say it's slow, not so much as in it, it's like I don't know how to explain. It. It's like you're using a really old laptop where you can go through and you can browse the web, you can browse files, view pictures, and stuff like that. You can even get on and do YouTube at like 480p if you wanted to, um, and it will stutter a bit and you'll see some screen tearing and things like that. Um, but it's usable for you know simple tasks. But if you're expecting to get on there, 
and do anything hardcore graphically intensive. And I mean, I'm not talking about going on there and playing Tomb Raider or you know Grand, Grand Theft Auto V. Nobody's expecting to be able to do that here. I mean, because frankly, why would you? You have Windows installed. You can just go play those win Windows games there. Um, but if you're going to do anything outside of like listening to music or uh, install VS Code, which is you know something you'd be expected to do, um, you're going to be run into some serious problems because it just doesn't have the power to do that. Um, I will also say that I didn't have a lot of time to play around with getting it to work better. So it's possible that I missed something. There's also the fact that Microsoft is working on a way to run Linux apps and perhaps desktop environments natively, which means you'll will no longer have to do the remote session thing. I think that that will significantly um, increase performance when that happens. And I'm definitely going to check that out when it does. Um, because if the, if, you know, it'd be really cool if you could run, I don't know, a, you know, a Linux app and a Windows app side by side and not have to worry about the remote session thing. Um, that'd be really cool. Uh, the question I've asked myself is, would I use WSL? I'm not a developer outside of some, you know, web development. Um, and that doesn't require me to be on Windows. I'm not required at all to be on Windows. I have a Linux, like I said, I have a Windows partition for like Hearthstone and uh, Destiny seems to run better on Windows. So I just, you know, do when I play Destiny, I use Windows. Um, but I don't do that uh, very often. Most of my time is 100% spent on Linux and I don't see that changing. Um, but I asked myself this, would I use WSL if I were using Windows? Um, and I'd say maybe. There are some terminal applications that I would love to have on Windows if I were to use it a lot, like Ranger or Vim, <laughs> you know, whatever. But the thing is, there's some there's some uh, things that just don't work. So, like, you can't, you know, you really can't access files outside of the, the VM. It's a little bit difficult. SSH and Samba and the like would probably work fine. I didn't give it a real good chance of testing that out. Um, but it's not native access, so that there's you know that extra hurdle that you have to do in order to actually you know access your files. You know, like I said, I didn't spend a lot of time with WSL, so maybe that there's a way around to get to get native access outside of a VM. So I'll have to keep looking on that. Um, but if there's not, it's just that. Uh, Keeping all your files on the VM or having to, you know, SSH into a, you know, another computer or into your, even just into your Windows uh, file system, that's kind of a pain in the butt. And I just don't think that, frankly, I would just rather use Linux. I think I think that's what, what this boils down to is I'd just rather use Linux. If I'm going to use, if I have to use Linux, I might as well just go full bore and install Linux. Dual booting doesn't bother me. Um... Outside of the fact that I never used the dual boot. I just, once I'm on Linux, I'm on Linux and I have, you know, all my tools there and I can do everything I want to do. Um, so that really leads into the, the next and final section of the podcast. Does WSL hurt Linux adoption or help it? So ever since WSL was announced by Microsoft in, uh, uh, I think it was 2017, maybe 2018, I'm not sure. Uh, the question of how this affects Linux has been a serious discussion amongst Linux pundits and experts. Uh, you, you, you'll hear Brian Lunduke talk about it. I'm always picking on, on Lunduke. You, you, you'll hear uh, Joe Collins talk about it, and uh, you know all, all these Linux YouTubers that you know talk about WSL and, and how uh, it, some of them say it's a you know the the, the Opponents of WSL will state that because you can now run Linux on Windows, there's no reason to actually install Linux, hence hurting Windows, Linux adoption. After all, if you don't have to, why install Linux if you have to use Windows? It makes Linux redundant, or so the argument goes. Uh, others will say that this is nonsense, that even if you start out with WSL, Linux is just as attractive as it always has been. Even more, they argue, if people give WSL a try and like Linux so much so much they might go ahead and install a distro for real whereas they might not have otherwise done so now 
I have problems with both of these. Personally, I fall somewhere in between. So, my, some of my resistance towards WSL is because uh, has more to do with Microsoft, with the Microsoft from yesteryear, and <laughs> I, I really did write yesteryear in the script for this episode, which is hilarious, um, <laughs> and their opposition to op- open source. Um, that's not the Linux or the Microsoft of today. Microsoft today actually seems to like Linux and open source a lot. You know, they open up, they they open source some things. They even have a uh, their own Linux distribution for IoT devices, which is you know and kind of insane. Also, I'm not sold on the idea that if you use WSL, you'll think about installing Linux. Um, chances are, if if you're going to go through the hurdles of installing WSL. You aren't incapable of installing Linux in the first place, but there's actually the reason why you're doing it in this particular way uh, means that you're uh, you have to be on Windows, right? So chances are you've chosen to, to go the WSL route, even though you could do Linux because you have to. Um, It's uh, so so the other argument is uh, that uh, it hurts, you know, that it will it will drive people towards using Linux. Uh, I don't, so I don't think that the. All right, let me start this over. <laughs> I'm losing my train of thought. I don't think it hurts Linux in any way. For one, the performance isn't great. Like I talked about, it's slow as of right now. Uh, so it's not going to keep people from installing Linux because it's so awesome that they can't be bothered. Second, there's still a lot that you can't do with WSL that you need Linux to do. That being said, for developers who need Linux but can't leave the Win- Windows desktop behind, I think WSL is a great tool that will allow them to somewhat have the best of both worlds. I can also see, uh, I, I, and I also think that it will get better and better over time as Microsoft makes perform better and adds native Linux app support and so on. If WSL does get to the point where it is as good as booting into Linux and a native Linux environment, then maybe Linux would have a problem. But I don't think that, that that's a lot to worry about because not only is that far off into the distance, but also it, at that point it would expose people to the awesomeness of Linux. Now, that's the argument of that that's the that takes care of the argument about how this might WSL might hurt Linux. What about the argument that uh, it will expose more people to Linux right now, at the way WSL is now? I think this is utter nonsense. <laughs> I mean, because if you use WSL, it's such a it's a fair, it's a poor experience for anything outside of development. Uh, so if if you're if you're knowledgeable enough to install WSL, but you're not a developer, you're going to go into this with a bad. You're going to come out of it with a bad experience of Linux because it's not fantastic for the things most people want to do. Like if you want to, you know, browse the web or, or you know, um, play a Linux game or whatever, it, WSL is not great for that. It's meant for development. Uh, so I don't think that WSL is a a great advertisement or marketing tool for Linux. I think both of these arguments really kind of miss the point. WSL is for a small group of people who know that they need it, uh, and they're, those people are developers that require access to Linux tools but cannot leave Windows behind. That's what WSL is for, and that's what I think WSL will always be. It's not going to hurt Linux adoption because it's never going to replace a lot of the things that Linux can do. Even if Linux, even if Microsoft goes through and gets everything uh, GUI, you know, working fantastically, there's still going to be things that you're going to want to do on Linux. For and there's just because also in that theoretical future where thing Microsoft gets WSL work, working fantastically, it it this doesn't take away the flaws that Windows itself has. So one of the reasons why you use Linux is because you don't want to use Windows. And I think 
So, for example, time for a Linux or a Windows rant, y'all. Uh, Linux, like Linux pundit complains about Windows news at eleven. Uh, <laughs> um, so, I, like I mentioned, I don't use my Windows partition very often. It, you know, maybe once every month or so, maybe twice, not that often at all. And usually it's for like an hour, and then I'll <laughs> then I'll go back to when, when you know Linux. And one of the reasons why is because every time I turn the damn Windows on, you have updates. Now I understand Linux gets updates too, but I get to choose on Linux when to do my updates. I could wait a year if I wanted to, or do. I mean, it'd be dumb, but I could. Linux doesn't force me to go through and restart my computer four times in order to finally get to do what I want to do, and that really bothers me. That's the reason why I don't use Windows. And I think that the, I mean, that's, and Windows rant, I think that WSL being awesome doesn't negate the fact that Windows is terrible. I'm just, you know, going to throw that out there. Um, it's possible if it gets to the point where WSL is, is very, very good, people might see how good Linux is and then decide that they're going to either do boot or just switch to Linux completely. But it's not there yet. I don't know if it'll ever get there. So the two arguments is the about WSL and the Linux community is are, are both wrong-headed, I think, just because it doesn't they don't address the what WSL really is, and that is a tool for developers who can't switch to Linux. Um, so that's what WSL is. So that is my, uh, my my thoughts on Windows Subsystem for Linux. I got the name right. And I, I, just in conclusion, I really I learned quite a lot uh, in, in this process. Uh, and I was reminded of quite a lot. I, I've been reminded of why I don't like Windows, <laughs> which I'm reminded of that every time I log into Windows. I, I'm also learned that WSL is, while it has technical limitations and is slow, is really cool. I really, I, I it, from a, a nerd perspective, it's really very cool that you can go on Windows and use Linux. I can't really explain why it's cool. It just I mean, because, I mean, really, if you think about it, you've been able to use Linux on Windows forever. There have been VMs of, uh, you know, virtual machines managers like Parallels and whatever for, you know, decades at this point. And you could you, you can install Linux through those. But this is Linux running, excuse me, basically natively on Windows, and it's really cool. Um I then st so I guess I, you know I I talked about or before I go I should talk about this this is completely out of order but I guess it doesn't really matter I I, I mentioned how I thought Linux installing Linux was actually easier than installing WSL and I mentioned the virtualization thing which I found to be the hardest part but really it's not the only hard part so you you have to go through and you have to enable WSL and you have to enable virtual machine technology within Windows and there's two different ways of doing that and it's not clear on which way you should do it. You can either use PowerShell or you can do it through uh, a GUI settings menu or whatever. Um, and the Microsoft documentation isn't all that great. So I had problems with that to begin with. Um, and then I found a good Linux video or not a good Linux, a good a good YouTube video, I got Linux on the mind, uh, and and that is finally what had me go through, it and it had me be successful at uh, installing WSL. So it's not it, it's a multi perp process, and at the moment, if you want to get GUI applications, it's, it's a workaround, and there's like 12 commands or so that you have to go through and run, and you have to be comfortable, you know, with said and. Uh, you know the copy command and vim or, or nano and it's just not it's it's not user friendly so the, the installation things was 
honestly, I would have recorded this last week if I'd been success, more successful in installing this, you know, last week. So, anyways, I've completely lost my lit train of thought of where I was in conclusions, but I, I, it just really is cool. Um, I don't think that it's going to take away from Linux at all. Um, that's just my thought on it. Anyways. Before I sit here and ramble on for, you know, an hour and a half or something on, on this, that is it for this episode of the Linux Cast. I will go through and uh, I, I have my little script here that I've, you know, I'm supposed to be reading this out verbatim because it's supposed to be, it's supposed to protect me from saying um and oh and uh and oh my god and terrible things. Uh, you, you know, over and over again, but I've deviated from that. But I do post that in the sh- in the show notes. If you want to see those show notes, you can either look in the podcast you're doing, or at linuxcast.org, the linuxcast.org, I should say, or on uh, YouTube as well. Um, and uh, you can you now we don't have um uh, our next episode. That's what that's the last thing I need to talk about. I'm going to be talking about how Linux on mobile is doomed. Because doomed is the uh, is exactly what Linux on mobile is. It's not it's not a good situation if you want to use Linux on your phone, mobile phone. Anyways, that is uh, it for this time. If you want to get in contact with me, you can do so at MTWB on Twitter. I am still looking for a co-host, so I don't have to sit here and talk to myself uh, all the time. So if you're interested in being a co-host for with a Linux, basically a Linux noob. Uh, give me a DM on Twitter or email me at thelinuxcast at gmail.com. And uh, we'll see you next time.